This is the second of a series of six lectures that Professor Wilczek will be giving on, on titled Futures, in which he's going to talk about the, um, the various futures that, that science um, can, uh, whereas futures involving both uh, involving science and, and man and mankind's role, conception of itself. Um, so uh, let me begin by uh, reminding you that uh, there's going to be questions and answers afterwards. So if you have any uh, questions, just uh, type them into the, uh, into the chat and we'll select uh, among those questions and uh, get to them after the talk. So I wanted to um, start by uh, introducing um, Frank Wilczek. And it's a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to introduce him. He's my friend, colleague, mentor, and former PhD advisor. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know him, uh, Frank Wilczek is one of the great theoretical physicists of our era. Um, and we live in a time where people, where physicists and scientists in general, uh, are very specialized. Uh, and yet Frank has somehow managed to uh, work in an extremely broad range of fields. And he has had profound and seminal contributions in uh, everything from gravity to particle physics to cosmology and dark matter, and even to the idea of new forms of two-dimensional matter that can be used in quantum computers. Um, so he is... Uh, uh, I'm, I'll be introducing him repeatedly over the next few lectures, so I'm not going to tell you everything about him all at once, but uh, he's best known for his discovery of asymptotic freedom, uh, which is the statement that um, when you have uh, quarks that are, uh, that are the tiny constituents, particles that form protons and neutrons, uh, the quarks actually stop interacting with each other when they get very close. So it's exactly the opposite of gravity or electromagnetism where the forces get very strong when particles are very close to each other. Um, and uh, this discovery of um, Frank's ex explanation of this property known as asymptotic freedom um, uh, really put the strong, uh, really put our, uh, is one of the sort of uh, foundational pillars of uh, the strong interactions, which are now one of the, uh, which describe one of the four forces um, of nature that we have. So it's an extremely important result. And for that, he was awarded the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physics. And even better, uh, Frank is an, uh, at ASU as a uh, regular visiting uh, a member of the faculty. He comes, um, every year in spring and spends uh, uh, several weeks with us. So uh, every year he does something different and we're very happy to that this year he's, he's uh, motivated partly by his winning the Templeton Prize last year. He's decided to do something very, um, very conceptual uh, in, uh, and a little bit different from a purely scientific questioning, uh, scientific um, inquiry and he's going to tell us about the role that that um, science will play for humankind if that's the way to characterize it um, so uh, without any further ado I'm going to hand it over to uh, Professor Wilczek um, on to you perfect thank you Malik and I'll uh, show my face for a moment but then uh, I'm going to start sharing screen and here we go. So as Malik mentioned, this is the second lecture in a series of four, of six rather. This, the, uh, the first one was setting the context. We're going to be examining how science uh, can inform questions of meaning and purpose. 
the way it does so is what I call the threefold way. It Science properly tells us about what is, but knowing what is uh, informs our vision of what could be, and then our visions of what could be allow us to think in a inf more informed, sophisticated way about what should and shouldn't be. And then uh, given that menu, we can think about what is and in that way uh, direct our efforts in seeing that the world develops in directions that we want it to develop and avoid directions that we don't want to develop it to develop and in that way uh, give meaning and purpose to life. So in this lecture, this I will inaugurate a series of three where I will discuss more specifically uh, the frontiers of the, the extremely vital broad areas of science that uh, contribute to this discussion beginning with matter in this lecture and then moving on to life and mind in the two subsequent lectures. So let me begin. First of all, uh, a definition by matter in this context, I mean everything in the physical world. Uh, the, Sometimes in common usage, one makes a distinction between matter and light or matter and uh, motion or matter and spirit. But here in this, dis for, this dis for purposes of this discussion, uh, by definition, matter means everything in the physical world. And if, it if there's some phenomena in the physical world that you don't think is accounted for by our understanding of matter, then we have to understand. We have to modify the uh, under our understanding of matter, augment it, or change it. And in this lecture, as in the subsequent two, I will be following a format that I think is very helpful in organizing the the discussion and giving it direction. I will first talk about foundations then about frontiers, and then finally about horizons. So uh, the basics that we've come to understand about matter, life, and mind, uh, the frontiers of current investigation, and the longer term perspectives of what could be, so we can think about what should be. So foundations. This is a quotation that I love from Richard Feynman, the great physicist. He said, and I think correctly, that from a long view of the history of mankind, see, seen say 10,000 years from now, there can be little doubt that the most significant event of the 19th century will be judged as Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electrodynamics. The American Civil War will pale into provincial insignificance in comparison with this important scientific event of the same decade. Well, what about the 20th century? <laughs> and a corresponding quotation for the 20th century, I think, is from another great theoretical physicist, Paul Dirac, who said that the fundamental laws necessary for mathematical treatment of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known, and the difficulty lies only in the fact that application of these laws leads to equations that are too complex to be solved. I think achieving a level of understanding of matter uh, as described in this quotation from 1928, will stand as the great achievement in certainly in the physical sciences in the 20th century. And uh, 
from the long-term perspective and a man as as one of the great highlights of mankind's development this quotation as i said comes from 1928 subsequent developments however have verif have amp have uh, not only uh, justified it but augmented it because uh, Dirac at this time was referring to the understanding based on quantum mechanics and quantum electrodynamics that gives us the basis of chemistry and a lot of physics. Since then, we've gone even further in uh, understanding the behavior of matter, where by matter I mean everything that, that we've encountered. Uh, and that's a, uh, understanding has re reached such a level of sophistication and uh, digestion that it can be stated or without loss of content uh, on a t-shirt. There, there's the proof, there's the t-shirt. That might be a little hard to read. Let me just spell it out a little bit more. Uh, of course, I won't, whoops, I won't be able to do uh, justice to any of the, the details. Uh, but the current understanding of how matter works is based on the principles of quantum mechanics, which in this equation show up uh, in this part that, as you see, indicated uh, the understanding of gravity is based on uh, the idea, well, the, understand the framework of everything is space-time and uh, motion within space-time. Uh, space-time can be warped, and that gives rise to gravitation. That's described in that part of the equations. The other forces are the strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces. They all have a very similar form and can be derived from that piece of the master equation. And then matter in the narrow sense, that is uh, things we think of as substances like electrons and quarks are described in that part of the equation. And then some more uh, refined details of the behavior, including uh, some of the, 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 the mass as opposed to the interactions of the particles uh, is encoded in what's called the Higgs sector. And that's it. And of course, this, uh, just appears as hieroglyphics uh, if you, you're not familiar with the uh, meaning of all the symbols. But the deep message that I'd like to convey here is that this is this gives you very definite algorithms, very specific algorithms that could be taught to a computer in a rather short program, and running that program would uh, give you the the world, everything that we know that populates the world. Specifically, uh, it would give you the it would give you the periodic table, which of course was uh, discovered and implemented uh, as an empirical set of. Uh, discoveries about different kinds of substances that couldn't be reduced chemically. This now can be entirely and convincingly derived from the basic equations. And in fact, uh, it's a very beautiful subject that we teach undergraduates how the basic laws of quantum mechanics and, uh, quant and uh, electricity and magnetism plus the fact that matter is organized into atomic nuclei and electrons, which are part of this standard model, uh, leads through beautiful mathematics of symmetry to a, an understanding of why the periodic table has exactly the structure it does and why the names that appear in the periodic table correspond to substances that obey and that behave in the way they do. 
And that was what Dirac was primarily referring to. But now we can go even further. We can understand the atomic nuclei themselves on the basis of quantum electrodynamics, that, uh, that theory that uh, Malik alluded to, that, uh, well, I basically discovered. <laughs> and, and this allows us to understand, uh, for instance, the underlying equations that tell us how atomic nuclei behave, how they can transform into one another, how stars burn, and such and uh, other things that aren't described by quantum electrodynamics. And this has this understanding of the deep laws of physics has also allowed us to give a uh, broad and convincing uh, outline of the origin of things and provided excuses for the details of the origins that we don't understand, we can't understand solely on the basis of physics. Uh, like why frogs have four legs, for instance. But, uh, but the broad outlines of structure in the universe, uh, we can understand on the basis of simple hypotheses about how simple things were in the early universe, plus the laws of physics as encoded on that t-shirt. And uh, a, a quantitative triumph of that picture was, of that understanding was the observation of small deviations from uniformity in the microwave sky shown here in this famous picture of the microwave background radiation. The contrast here is dialed up by about a factor of 10,000. The actual contrast is uh, very, very slight, but those small inhomogeneities, those small contrasts in density in the early universe, we understand evolving through the equations, give us um, the, the kinds of galaxies and structures that we observe through our telescopes today. And another uh, aspect of understanding origins is we can understand not only why there are the different elements, but also how much of the different elements are, exist in, 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 in the cosmos and where they came from. Uh, the initial Big Bang produced only hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. You can see that in the picture. Uh, there's a rich and detailed story about the origin of the other parts of the other uh, 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 substances that we encounter, encounter in nature. Let me just give one highlight, which is a very recent vintage. You see this purple color here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, Actually, I can't, <laughs> uh, but let's try again. No. Um, yeah, the, the, the purple color is uh, a recent development where we've understood that uh, many of the heavier elements including uh, uranium, gold, silver, uh, mostly originated in a very remarkable way uh, in the merger between neutron stars. So burnt out stars become uh, very, very tiny, dense objects called neutron stars. And they're just what they sound like, giant atomic nuclei made out of uh, neutrons and when you have pairs of neutron stars, they lose energy by gravitational radiation and uh, eventually uh, crash into each other as the orbits decay. And when they do, uh, they spit off uh, a lot of stuff that's neutron rich, and that's how you get the elements that are uh, neutron rich, the heavier elements. This was a mystery for a long time, but thanks to the detection of gravitational waves, we've actually caught 
some neutron stars in the act of merging and have been able to monitor uh, this process now uh, in real time. Uh, it would be a crime not to mention that the periodic table does not include an, uh, light, which is a, a very basic element of uh, uh, matter in the world, but we have the theory for that, and, uh, and that theory has been proved out by not only describing visible light, which was what Maxwell had at hand uh, when he made his identification that light is a manifestation of electrodynamics, but also uh, all the many other forms of things that appear to be quite different superficially turn out to be all described by the same equation and are uh, uh, under, properly understood as uh, uh, essentially the same as visible light, just seen from uh, platforms moving at different velocities. Or uh, another way of looking at it is it's light of different wavelengths that uh, our, our eyes don't see, but have uh, physical effects as, as de depicted here. So those are the, uh, is that, that's a, a brief, but I hope meaningful indication of the foundations of our understanding and its power and some allusions to the evidence that it's correct and has been very fruitful. Now I'd like to discuss frontiers. Well, as Dirac said, we have the equations, but uh, actually computing them in any but the simplest circumstances, computing their consequences uh, gets very difficult. What's changed since 1928, however, is that we've gotten much, much better at computing. And so uh, one of the frontiers of understanding and exploiting our understanding of matter is to try to do for chemistry what has been done already for architecture and aircraft design, which is take it out of the realm of building little models with uh, matchsticks or Legos or whatever, in the case of architecture, or in the case of aircraft, uh, models that you take to wind tunnels. So, sorry. Um, and replace or supplement, augment the uh, chemistry laboratories with banks of computers. So nowadays, no one would dream of uh, testing, of, of building models of airplanes to test in wind tunnels or little uh, matchstick models of architectural designs uh, uh, to, in a serious uh, investigation. You do computer model. And that's a frontier of physics and our understanding of matter and chemistry is to use the equations of quantum mechanics to understand in detail how chemical react and to predict how uh, chemical reactions will occur. A particular frontier that I think is going to be very exciting in coming years is taking some of the art out of uh, designing uh, chemical syntheses. This was a very important uh, chemical synthesis of something called Tamiflu uh, that people wanted to have, and a great chemist named Corey figured out how to do it, but it was the, an act of great creativity. Nowadays, uh, well, I don't think this has happened yet, but the writing is on the wall that uh, using techniques of machine learning and uh, extending from playing games like chess and go and solving how proteins fold, which are recent achievements of that approach, will have uh, 
programs and machines that will help us design chemical syntheses and be able to tackle more advanced ones and turn the art of making catalysts, which at present is largely a black art, uh, empirically based, but very, very important in uh, all kinds of industrial processes and biology and biological pharmaceutical processes, turn that also into something that's systematic and extensible. Another frontier of present day investigations that uh, are relevant to the questions of what could be and ultimately what should be in our future is the challenge of generating increasing amounts of energy that our advanced uh, society relies on, especially as the first world grows into what used to be uh, the second world, second at the developing regions of the world, hopefully. <clears throat> and we've learned that the way we've been primarily generating energy by burn burning fossil fuels is first of all, not sustainable because the fossil fuels will run out. They're not a renewable resource. And secondly, because they have externalities, they have side effects, which are very undesirable. In particular, they create carbon dioxide as a byproduct, and that is as famously uh, having deleterious, disastrous effects on our climate. <clears throat> but uh, there's a, another kind of energy locked up in atomic nuclei. That is, when you look at the energy bound up because of the strong interaction as nuclei are made, uh, the most advantageous way for neutrons and protons to develop themselves, to organize themselves, as far as the minimum energy per particle, or so the, the, the most uh, bound up form of uh, nucleus is actually an iron nucleus. So uh, you can liberate energy by making other nuclei uh, try to be like iron. So if you have heavier nuclei, you can split them into smaller pieces and liberate energy as they get smaller. Or if you have uh, smaller nuclei than iron, you can liberate energy by building them up towards iron. In particular, on the left-hand side of uh, this graph, of this, you see that uh, hydrogen and uh, its uh, and helium, hydrogen and uh, uh, in particular, uh, is much less energy efficient than helium, and you can generate a lot of energy by turning hydrogen into helium in principle. So this is the uh, realm of fission, where you go from bigger nuclei towards the smaller nuclei that are more favorable. And this is, occurs by uh, having, uh, in practice, by having a slow neutron impinging on fuel that's uh, ready to split when uh, coaxed by having a little energy and a little extra neutron uh, that initiates the reaction. A feature of these reactions is that uh, when you put, when the nuclei split up, they emit further neutrons. And so you can have a chain reaction. So either if you have, uh, if you, if the chain reaction is sl uh, slow, if it's moderated, you can liberate energy at a usable pace, or uh, you can make a bomb. And the use of fission as an energy source has a very bad reputation, uh, in, especially in the United States, but actually has been implemented on a very large scale 
safely for many, many years in France, where they generate 70% of their uh, energy through fission, 70% of their electrical energy through fission, and have never had a serious accident. The other uh, way to exploit nuclear energy is uh, through fusion, taking different isotopes of hydrogen in practice and turning them into helium here. Uh, the problem is to get this reaction to go, uh, you have to overcome long range repulsions between these nuclei, which have uh, both have positive charge. And so you have to run these things hot. Uh, that's why they naturally occur in the sun, in the center of the sun, where you have extremely high temperatures and densities, but are much more difficult to achieve here on Earth. Uh, you have to cage the hyd hydrogen that you want to burn and heat it up, and it wants to escape, but you try to keep it in with magnetic fields, and it's very, very challenging. And for uh, almost for 80 years now, fusion has been the energy of the future, and it still is. But uh, in practice, there are very, very great challenges to making it work. So here's an uh, an executive summary of the status of fission and fusion. For fission, it's a mature technology ready for use and already used, safer than its reputation, much safer than fossil fuels, both from the point of view of climate and from the point of view of just not killing people. Uh, mining fossil fuels has been a very dangerous enterprise. Uh, fossil fuels also, besides changing the climate, also produce lots of noxious gases. Also, fossil fuel reactors also have accidents, and they have a much worse safety record than fission. However, fission has very serious issues around waste products. They really, the radioactive products they produce really are dangerous, and uh, they can be used uh, for... Uh, nuclear weapons if not properly handled. So those have definitely need attention. However, as France has demonstrated, it is possible to solve those problems. So fission is great. Fusion is not a mature technology, not ready for use. However, if it can be made to work, it's very safe. It doesn't produce waste products and would be quite wonderful. We do have a great working fusion reactor in the sky, namely the sun, which does supply uh, most of our energy, either uh, directly in the, the biosphere where plants and animals bask in the sun and get energy out of it, uh, and indirectly in fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are stored energy from the sun, uh, basically old plants that have uh, under pressure turned into uh, liquid fuels that, that can be burnt. But uh, there's a much better way, a much more sophisticated way uh, to use solar energy and turn it into energy that uh, is more easily used and transported and more versatile to turn it into electrical energy, namely. Uh, and the modern development of photovoltaics has been a, an astonishing success story. Uh, when I was a child, which was in living memory by definition, <laughs> although with each passing year it gets to be longer and longer ago, uh, there was no such thing, these, these, there was no remote possibility of uh, economical use of uh, solar energy, uh, but now it is used on a large scale. You see these uh, photovoltaic panels uh, on, on farms like this that farm the, uh, the sun's energy, also on uh, housetop roofs. And 
The economics has gotten very, very uh, good. Uh, here you can see how photovoltaic energy, when you take into account everything that goes into it, uh, including making the panels and and uh, and implementing the construction, is already the, uh, competitive with all other forms, and the price is steadily dropping. <clears throat> So that's the long-term future of energy uh, generation. And uh, also important is the question of what you do with this energy to make it uh, distributed and useful. And here again, uh, this is a rather unglamorous field, battery research. Batteries have gotten better, but not compared to computers or, uh, or other uh, dramatic developments in physics and, uh, and biology. However, uh, there's, there definitely has been incremental improvement in terms of density of storage, reusability, um, not generating nasty waste products and so forth. And the empirical investigation of, well, um, ultimately we'd like to compute these things using the techniques I mentioned earlier and the knowledge we've, we've the secure knowledge of matter we have, but at present we, uh, the, the investigation is largely empirical and it's gonna be, is being empowered and is going to be furthered by machine learning. There are also, uh, Jane, the timer went off. Should I turn the thing off? Turn the heat off. Turn the heat off. Okay. I'm sorry. We get, somebody should mute themselves. <laughs> uh, then uh, uh, there are uh, batteries, not only of a chemical nature, but things called supercapacitors and storing energy in superconducting uh, circuits, and that that lead to uh, energy stored in magnetic fields. These are very promising. Uh, technologies that will allow us to store and transmit energy uh, even more efficiently with things like a smart grid and miniaturization in the future. A vast subject that uh, uh, Professor Stuart Lindsay is a great expert on here is the subject of nanotechnology. This is building artificial materials uh, that uh, are so uh, can perform all kinds of tricks and uh, metamaterials is uh, a very closely related uh, uh, idea. Nanotechnology is based on making really small units that have advantages over natural atoms. Just, I'll show that uh, momentarily. Uh, metamaterials are uh, the same thing you, you, uh, using units that are, uh, but, but units that are much bigger than atoms to build up uh, materials that, that are useful uh, by, by being intelligent about it and, uh, and exploiting our ability to make units that are uh, designed themselves and uh, and in the case of metamaterials can be sufficiently large that they can even incorporate information processing. Yeah. So quantum dots are a leading uh, nanotechnology and they are essentially designer atoms. So the atoms that occur in nature are the atoms of the periodic table, but uh, you can assemble electrons in small spaces uh, by using uh, depositions of positive charge that are not necessarily nuclei. Uh, of course, mole molecules do that, but again, uh, they are um, uh, not, they, they, they're taken from nature, not necessarily designed. Uh, uh, quantum dots, take this to another level by assembling electrons in designed control ways and making artificial atoms that can have uh, designed 
interactions with light, uh, for instance, or designed interactions with each other and can be used and are being used for all kinds of things as indicated here. And metamaterials are designer materials on a larger scale. Uh, this is just one example where uh, by uh, using these kind of building blocks, you can make materials that are very, very strong uh, and yet uh, light because they, they have lots of empty space. A very exciting frontier that's a hot thing today is quantum technologies. Our understanding of quantum theory has enabled us to make extraordinarily accurate clocks, so-called atomic clocks. The great thing about atomic clocks is that they don't have friction. The, the great mechanical clocks uh, were always struggled against the fact that they run down, they have friction, and that, that makes their uh, action change with time, and that's not something you want in a clock. Uh, even uh, piezoelectric quartz clocks, the next generation of clocks, which are much better, still have some friction because they're based on uh, large materials that rub against each other. Uh, whereas atomic clocks are really small, <laughs> they, uh, they don't have friction, and they, they run very reliably for a long time. The trouble, of course, is that you have to isolate single atoms and monitor them and access them. Access to them is, uh, is tricky, and but so it requires elaborate equipment uh, to get the most accurate clocks. You, you build something like this, which has a vacuum chamber and quad cryogenics and lasers that come in and out to, to read what the atoms are doing. But uh, that kind of atomic clock has proven accuracy to within once that equivalent to one second uh, in, uh, of uh, uncertainty over the lifetime of the universe. So one second per uh, 10 billion years or so. Uh, what does that mean? That means if you take two, two of these atomic clocks in different parts of the world, and compare the, the measures of time that they have. Uh, of course, you measure much more accurately than one second over much shorter times than the lifetime of the universe, but the proportional discrepancy between uh, those two such clocks is uh, in this proportion. <clears throat> uh, there are still extraordinarily impressive, but more practical clocks that empower GPS, uh, give a worldwide synchronization of uh, any kinds of transit. Uh, well, a less exalted use is tra tra uh, financial transactions, <laughs> trying to see who, who bid first on something, for instance, but, but many other uses of being able to synchronize activity in different parts of the world. You, very accurate measurements of gravitational fields by using re, amazingly uh, the effect that uh, different amounts of gravity cause clocks to slow down by small amounts, according to the general theory of relativity. So by having accurate clocks and taking them to different places, you can see how strong the gravitational field is, and in that way, get a sense of what's underground. If there's something dense, that might be a useful mine, or if there's something undense, that use, might be a useful oil well, you can detect it from afar using these atomic clocks. So there's a high premium on that kind of extraordinary accuracy. A, another frontier of quantum technology that's very exciting and very dynamic these days is the construction of quantum simulators and quantum computers. Quantum simulators are basically for matter, uh, what wind tunnels were for uh, aerodynamics. That is, if you want to 
model a potential crystal or an existing kind of crystal uh, instead of going of a chemistry lab uh, cooking and cooking and using smelly substances and so forth, uh, you can uh, uh, simulate important aspects of the behavior in a scale model, so to speak, uh, by instead of building a, a lattice of atoms, uh, build in a cross crossed laser beams that make places where atoms want to be and put in whatever atoms you want to have, whatever kind of atoms you want to have, and having a model crystal that uh, gives you uh, a rescaled version of the behavior you're interested in in a much more convenient form for investigation. And quantum computers are something I'll talk about uh, in much greater depth in the, the lecture on, on mind. Uh, but just let me at the moment say that if we want to deliver on Dirac's promise that all of physics and most of chemistry is governed by the equations we know, but they're hard to solve by solving those equations better and better and computers that exploit the principles of quantum mechanics to do computations that are very, very difficult and awkward to do um, with current day computers are uh, a work in progress. And although there's a long way to go, uh, the progress has been rapid and these quantum computers should be very, very good at doing quantum mechanics and uh, delivering on its promise. <clears throat> we also have the thriving area of quantum sensors. Uh, this uh, tech, uh, one, uh, I'll just give a couple of representative technologies very rapidly to give a sense of, of some of the activity. Uh, one thing you can do is put a very, put a, what's called a vacancy center inside a nano diamond. So a diamond that's uh, very, very small, a few angstroms across. Uh, so you, and, and you can place it very, very accurately and use that uh, to sense what's going on in the nearby environment and get a very delicate probe of, uh, by inter seeing how that, uh, center that it's another kind of artificial atom in effect uh how that interacts with light uh you that gives a uh, a way of detecting what the conditions are where to, where that atom is because those conditions modify the interaction with light and this is a way of putting so to speak a very sensitive chemistry lab wherever you want it with great precision and monitoring the materials you want you're interested in, including biological materials, for instance. Magnetic resonance, which is now a technology that uh, is routinely implemented at uh, hospitals and gives fantastic pictures in real time of what's going on inside uh, human bodies and, of course, many other things is a tour de force in quantum mechanics. It's based on the interaction of spins of atomic nuclei with magnetic fields, which you uh, cleverly design. You have a, a big magnetic field, but you also have small radio frequency fields that uh, in turn align, align the spins and tickle them. And you see uh, how, what, what they, how they uh, laugh in response, so to speak, to the tickling. And that kind of information can be used to reconstruct uh, what, where those atoms are, and what they're, where those spins are, and what they're doing, and uh, enables one to take pictures of the insides of uh, things, including especially uh, human bodies. And uh, 
the art of uh, using this kind of very indirect information about uh, complicated things that you're interested in uh, to reconstruct what they're doing and what they're made of and how they're organized uh, is not only something that's that's used in uh, magnetic resonance imaging and other forms of medical imaging, the uh, uh, CAT scans, the CT scans that enabled my gallbladder problem to be correctly diagnosed, for instance, was another example of using advanced physics and tech and uh, computing to look inside things. Uh, and uh, let me quote from my uncle who told me something that made a big impression on me when I was a child. He said that uh, he that tooteth not his own horn, that horn will not be tooted. So uh, today I'm gonna toot my own horn a little bit. Uh, today I got uh, a very interesting uh, notification from, from my wife, Betsy, <laughs> that, uh, um, uh, uh, one of our recent uh, theoretical dreams has been realized. This is looking inside quantum states. So if you have a quantum simulator and it's giving you quantum mechanical behavior, it produces a wave function you're interested in. That wave function is a very complicated object. And the uh, challenge of extracting information from it is very great. And uh, in a rough analogy to uh, uh, CAT scan, which is computerized uh, X-ray tomography, uh, one can think about trying to look inside the quantum wave functions that are being produced by these simulators or quantum computers. And it turns out that a powerful technique to do that uh, is inspired by the game Mastermind, which you may know you tried to match a pattern by uh, guessing different uh, uh, templates that match it partially. So you sort of take random measurements on it, each of which gives you uh, information, and then you piece it together to get the whole pattern. And uh, this is something we proposed. And now it's been uh, experimentally verified. And uh, let me read the part in red here. So the, the findings gathered by Yang and his colleagues highlight the great potential of uh, quantum overlapping tomography, which is the technical word for what we proposed uh, uh, for understanding quantum states or studying quantum. In the future, they could thus encourage the use of this quantum state characterization method in both, both research and industrial settings, for instance, uh, a lot aiding the development of more advanced quantum computers or other quantum technologies. Uh, the other thing in red here is uh, et al. That's me, <laughs> et al. I, 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 my new name is et al. Okay, so, and this was the experimental range range, which shows you that uh, you need, uh, this is, uh, this technology as all, all modern quantum technologies uh, rely on very uh, tricky, sophisticated uh, designs that enable us big old objects, human beings and their uh, instruments to probe the interiors of atoms and quantum mechanical wave functions in profound ways. <clears throat> okay, so that uh, gives you, I hope, a sense of some of the frontiers that have been enabled by our profound understanding of the foundations. Now I'd like to uh, sketch some horizons. Uh, first of all, uh, since I'm going to be describing something, things that may sound outlandish, 
I, I want you to know that I'm trying to speculate responsibly and uh, the prospects that I offer are things that I think are quite realistic, although challenging. Uh, and part of describing what uh, could be is to also understand what what won't be won't can't be, and what you shouldn't waste your time thinking about. And here are some of those that I don't see how they could emerge from our present understanding of physics anytime soon, where soon means for a long time. Uh, so time travel uh, and and space and faster than light travel. It turns out that if uh, the theory of relativity is as correct as we think it is, then faster than light travel would also enable time travel and uh, uh, time travel involves all kinds of paradoxes, but more important than that, we know what the equations of matter are and they don't allow time travel. Uh, Space-time engineering, things like wormholes uh, that you can move around in or warp, warp drives that you see in, uh, um, in uh, Star Trek and such like uh, that you could imagine happening if you could engineer uh, the structure of space and time uh, in powerful ways, it seems to be very difficult. Uh, empirically, we know that uh, to you can, of course, bend space and time. The general theory of relativity says that uh, gravity is a manifestation in general is a manifestation of bending in space and time. On the other hand, it teaches us that space and time are extremely rigid. One measure of that is that, uh, as you may know, gravitational waves were detected recently in a tour de force of technology. People had to measure displacements caused by the bending of space and time that were approximately one one thousandth of the size of an atomic nucleus. So very, very small changes in, in the structure of space and time. And how did that occur? That occurred by having two enormously big black holes, many times the mass of the sun, uh, merging with each other and disrupting the structure of space and time that way. And you need that kind of investment in energy to in order to make such tiny changes in the structure of space and time. So uh, wormholes seem a very, which are gross distortions in the normal structure of space and time uh, seem very, very far out of reach. Uh, non-conservation of energy momentum or angular momentum uh, because of the profound way that not only because empirically we see that they are conserved, but also because of the profound way that we understand how those conservation laws are integrated in to the basic fundamental equations of physics. Uh, well, let's put it this way. If uh, if they were if they're not conserved, we have a lot of unlearning to do. And in general, the idea that there are exceptions to the laws of physics, uh, well, uh, could have been, but doesn't seem to be the case. <laughs> and that's actually connected to the uh, conservation of energy. Conservation of energy is deeply related to the fact that the laws of physics don't change in time and, uh, and the other laws are related to their unchanging nature in space and uh, under rotations, uh, those all seem to work very well and um, are a people do reproducible experiments everywhere all the time and uh, ex uh, exceptions don't arise. So uh, if, you're if you're thinking about uh, the power of positive thinking, 
or anything of that sort, uh, don't. <laughs> and one particular note, because uh, this speculation that the world is a simulation has somehow captured the imagination of many people. Uh, if the world is a simulation, then all bets are off and exceptions could very well be part of the program. Uh, but uh, the bets based on the principles of, uh, that I've outlined here uh, have been consistent winners so that if the world is a simulation, then the programmers have worked very hard to disguise that fact. <clears throat> okay, now let's move on to maybe the more interesting question of what things that could happen. <clears throat> Energy abundance I've described is a very real prospect. Looking to the distant future, uh, we can have solar panels, all around the sun, not only on the surface of the earth, but surrounding the star to get truly vast amounts of energies that could empower some of the extraordinarily advanced, ambitious engineering projects I'll be talking about in the next two lectures. This is called, I'm sorry, this is called the Dyson Sphere after the uh, wonderfully imaginative Physicist Freeman Dyson, who was also a good friend and uh, used to occupy the office just above me at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's the basic idea of cap that any sufficiently advanced civilization would want to capture a lot of energy from its sun, so not limited to the surface of a tiny planet, and uh, that this would be a way of doing it. Mm. A big feature of our future will be extended sensoria and actuators. That is the ability to sense things very far away richly and to act on them richly. Uh, a version of uh, a modest version of that is called the Internet of Things, where uh, you can, uh, from your your phone, uh, monitor things that are far away and use them. And you're probably all familiar with this in daily life. But I had a wonderful experience that uh, gives a hint of the future where I was sitting in my study in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, controlling a robot, uh, very much like this one, in uh, in Stockholm that was moving around, participating in a conference. I could, uh, uh, from my from my study, uh, see what the see what the robot was seeing, uh, hear what the robot was uh, hearing, talk to people, uh, control the movements, and I have to say that with a little bit of practice, I felt disembodied. I felt that I was in Stockholm, actually, and this kind of experience, I think, is going to be uh, the future, where we'll have an expanded sense of what our minds are. And, of course, these robots could be equipped with senses that we don't naturally have as well. So they could detect other forms of light, they could, um, they could be sensitive to ultrasound and so forth and so on. <clears throat> A specific project that I think uh, is going to be key to the exploration of space in realistic and economical ways is the possibility of a space elevator. This would be a very, very long uh, tower that uh, you would think it would, might want to collapse, but if it's big enough and goes far away enough, uh, the centrifugal force generated by its rotation around the earth can balance the gravitational force that wants to pull it down. It's a great concept. All you need to implement it is a strong enough material that doesn't tear apart under the 
a, a strain that's involved. Uh, currently, we're not quite there. We have uh, things called carbon nanotubes that are sufficiently strong, but uh, they're not yet reliably, uh, can't be reliably assembled into very, very large units that are coherent, but uh, this, this will happen. <laughs> and last but not least, we're talking about sensing the external world and actuating uh, and having actuators that allow us to uh, act on it in powerful ways from afar. Uh, with the advance of miniaturization and uh, the dreams of uh, having nanosurgeons that move inside our body and can sense what's going on and react to at a semi-molecular level to events there uh, this is coming also. <clears throat> uh, a beautiful idea that goes back to uh, the ancient Greek philosophers uh, uh, or the, the oracle at Delphi, whose motto was know thyself. Uh, well, most of our thoughts are hidden from us. Most of what's going on in our brains is unconscious. Uh, even the things we think we understand, uh, we don't really understand, certainly at a molecular level. But our sensing technologies, that some of which I've alluded to, are getting better and better. And one can imagine that in the future, you will stare, you will learn to interact with a computer screen, or a set of screens that's telling you what you what's going on in your brain in real time, and this will enable you to know yourself at a much more profound level, or also maybe uh, allow you to understand other people better if the, if they volunteer for this kind of uh, uh, exploration. So, in that very literal sense. We're approaching John Wheeler's vision of understanding the universe and our emergence from it allows us to look inside and understand ourselves very well and sort of close the loop of matter uh, understanding itself. So that ends today's lecture. Uh, let me just give you the teaser that uh, this is just the beginning <laughs> when we talk about life and mind, uh, more new horizons open up and I hope you'll join me for that exploration. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, so, um, Yes, let's thank uh, Frank for a very nice talk. Um, and now if, uh, if you have any questions, we can please enter them into the chat. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, kick things off by asking a question myself. Um, so in terms of what, since we're taking this big picture uh, view and um, we can ask, well, what, what are the really the limits of technology? And ultimately, of course, those are going to be determined by the laws of physics. Mm. But the laws of physics or the that we know have changed and evolved over time. Uh, so for example, things that we had uh, previously regarded as, impo as impossible uh, are now allowed. Uh, they've always been more and more, become more and more permissive in a way. Uh, for And a famous example is that in chemistry, um, you know, the law, the elements are all conserved. Um, so on both yeah. sides of the chemical equation. And so things like alchemy were uh, soon regarded as impossible. You couldn't transmute lead into gold or in fact, any element into any other element. Yeah. But now we do that routinely through both fusion and fission. Um, so 
in terms of, and we all, we know that our current theories are incomplete. Uh, they're incomplete because the standard model is uh, has has uh, has room to grow, but also they're incomplete because our the marriage of uh, of quantum mechanics and of of and gravity isn't uh, fully realized. So uh, there seems to be potential to uh, expand what we um, what what the space of the possible by uh, so uh, I was wondering what so I was especially taken by your statement that um, the time travel or space time engineering and wormholes and so forth are impossible of course they're very 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 remote and <laughs> from any practical sense but but um, um, no, yeah. I'm not saying I'm not saying that uh, they're necessarily impossible in principle, although there are very strong constraints on what what is possible, I think. Uh, but as I said, I was trying to be responsible in my speculations to uh, talk about things that I think are plausibly going to happen. Uh, maybe in a hundred years, maybe in a thousand years. In a hundred thousand years, things might look quite different. They might, you know, but but uh, I don't see the path. And let me counter what you said somewhat just now. Uh, the uh, things really changed in the 20th century. Yes, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were many hazy ideas that we had only hazy ideas about how matter worked, what it was, but that's all changed. <laughs> we we now have very precise, very well tested ideas uh, about the nature of matter and how it works, and uh, we can we have much better ideas, much a much better uh, grasp on what's feasible and what's not feasible. That's that's a big message that I hope uh, hope I got across. Uh, the, so yeah, so, uh, that's, that's my answer, I guess. Uh, but let me, so, uh, the good news is that having that understanding, uh, enables us to imagine wonderful possibilities, some of which I've described here and others I'll, uh, describe in the next couple of lectures. Uh, on the other hand, it also tells us what is unlikely to be achieved. And you're welcome to think about it, but um, I think unlikely doesn't do it justice. It's extremely unlikely. <laughs> in the, uh, so, and for the reasons I said, I mean, you know, space time engineering requires enormous amounts of uh, energy and activity and it's just I mean it's just not not on and uh what was the other thing you said I don't I don't know anyway the, uh, time travel which is the same kind yeah, of thing. time travel these, these, is, these sort of things are that is even worse because yeah, it, it, yeah. it brings in paradoxes so right. so uh, that, so yeah so if there is anything like that it's well maybe the good, so uh, the nice thing about time travel, <laughs> although, if you like, or the, is that uh, although uh, time travel in the sense of modifying the structure of space time so that you can move backwards in time uh, seems very unlikely, psychological time is very flexible. We can certainly imagine futures, we can imagine the past. That's a lot of what we do as humans. Um, and uh, computers can reconstruct the past very accurate, the past states very accurately. So uh, if we record a lot of information in computers, we can, we can uh, enhance our memories greatly. Of course, we can also uh, enrich our understanding of what, what the future is going to be in many, many ways. So uh, sort of the crass time travel that you read about in H.G. Wells seems out of reach, but 
more subtle, nuanced, but deeply meaningful forms of time travel, I think, are enabled by that. I should also add for the benefit of the audience that uh, when we talk about time travel, we're really referring to time travel to the past. Uh, time travel to the future is uh, readily possible. Um, uh, well, then we, that's what we do. Yes, <laughs> right. Um, where we, where, yeah, yeah we're, we're traveling to the future all the time, but also we can accelerate that. Uh, well, we can. That's maybe the, not the right word, but we can uh, change our passage into the future. Future by uh, going faster than light. Oh, not faster than light by going fast. Uh, so as as uh, particles like muons routinely do. Um, uh, he had a question. a question for this. Yes. Connect with this. Professor Frank, thank you for your presentation. It's an honor for me to watch a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I'm a poor physicist and never you'll be there like you. I'm particularly interested in the travel faster than light, not travel faster than light and no ice uh, What's your comment about the Alcubierre equations? There's something. The what equation? Good the to warp the space even as i was thinking about this okubieri is a mexican physicist he found a solution for the ice equations when you can warp so you don't travel faster than light because you travel inside the bubble but in theory you are moving faster than light so you just do you know the curvature of the space yeah. uh is there some controversy because it <laughs> is bet. or it's not <laughs> What's you're that? not do anything against it going faster than light because you can just go at one kilometer yeah. per hour, but right. because you distort the space, you can move 10,000 light years. Well, I'm not familiar with the particular thing that, that you mentioned, but I did address this question, I think, uh, uh, maybe indirectly or but I think fairly directly, which is that yes, it is possible to warp space and time. And in fact, all matter does that. Uh, and that's the modern understanding of or one way of understanding the force of gravity uh, in, in Einstein's general relativity, that's the way it works. Uh, but the amount of warping is calculable and very, very tiny in all practical, practical circumstances. And it takes massive colliding black holes to even make tiny ripples that you can barely detect. So the idea of doing gross engineering of space and time seems way out of reach. Yes, yeah, that, that I'm more interested in theoretical because Looks like uh, something against ice thing. Let's say you can solve the problem to the energy necessary. The equations are okay. I just put the name of the physicist in the okay, in thank chat. You. Yeah, we call Alcubierre metric. I'll, yep. I'll take a look. I'll take a look. But I, uh, I so there's I try some... to be yes. Okay, I'm trying to be at least reasonably practical. Yeah, we can. We can. Yeah. I mean, how should I say the. The lower you set your standards, the the easier you can get over them. <laughs> but, but I'm trying trying to set the, the standards where uh, I'm I'm uh, giving meaningful guidance about what can be and what should be. So another, uh, there's some questions. There's one from Betsy who says, who asks, how does a space elevator stick onto Earth despite its rotation and its revolution around the sun? Uh, well, there's a balance of forces. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of floating, <laughs> but it doesn't want to go anywhere. So it doesn't. Now in practice, of course, there'll be fluctuations. You, you need to nail it down a bit, but, but in, uh, basically, it's in equilibrium. It doesn't want to move, so it doesn't move. <laughs> uh, on a similar question, well, not similar. Uh, what are your thoughts on the future for light sail technology? Okay, yeah, that's a good technology too. Uh, that that uh, if you're very patient, you can exploit 
radiation from the sun <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and as a fuel and, uh, and use that to power uh, space travel. Uh, since, since there's not a lot of, I mean, the density of energy uh, uh, there, especially as you recede far from the sun, it gets very small. Uh, the amount of power you can get that way is, is limited. But uh, if you're patient and are, are willing to take uh, a long time to get, get around, uh, that, 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 that can be a, a, an energy efficient way to do it. Yeah. Um, then there's a question from Brian Calloway, who asks um, that uh, we will have, so he speculated earlier that we will have chemistry models that would be able to predict what combination of elements in what states and under what situations they would react in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in order to get materials that we want. Is that right? Yes. And, and even materials that we don't know what we want, because we can use the equations to... Uh, predict the pos the the uh, behavior of materials that don't actually exist. And then if we find that uh, that uh, they have desirable properties of different kinds, we can go out and make them. Yes. So there's a vast room for exploration there. Do you think it's reasonable that we will have uh, be able to test medicines without clinical trials? Yes by simply simulating the results and yes although you know it, it's uh that's not certainly not ready for prime time now but uh i you know i don't see any uh um, barrier in principle or even in practice to that being um an achievable goal in in the hundred year time frame maybe sooner well the reactions might be very very complicated uh, yes well, exactly well i'm going to talk about this a bit in the next lecture uh so yes things get very complicated the good news is that we have uh, silicon friends and maybe uh, new kinds of quantum computer friends that will be uh, ready and able to help us manage these issues <laughs> But there are limitations to that as well. Like, for example, uh, yes. despite the fact that we have supercomputers, uh, we have we're we're not able to make a you know weather forecast three weeks out, for example. And that's just because there are fundamental uh, yes. problems with uh, chaos, with nonlinear dynamics, and yes. that uh, that stand in the way of uh, m making those predictions. That's uh, correct. So that's true. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't think we bumped up against that kind of limit very much, very often yet in chemistry. Eventually we might. Then, yeah. then we'll have to uh, model the good, the good, the, the nice, well, no, well, maybe I should leave it at that, but, but weather is a particularly bad case, difficult case, because it's, um, it's a very large scale interacting system of, with many parts. Um, and well, part of the, the art of weather prediction and also the art of uh, science in general is isolating problems that you can solve. And we'll, we'll have to see I mean, what, what the limits, and it's a moving frontier, of course. You know, weather predictions now uh, are pretty good several days out. Uh, it it gets harder and harder as you try to go from days to weeks and things, but but uh, they're actually very good and much much better than they were fifty years ago, say incomparably better. So, yeah. so it's a moving target. So uh, we're almost out of time. So I'll ask uh, one last question, and I think this is a nice question because it uh, sort of segues into your next. Uh, uh, into your next uh, lecture, which, by the way, is on Friday uh, at 6 p.m. Um, so uh, please come to that, and um, it'll, it'll also be on Zoom, and I think the uh, lectures will resume in person uh, from the fourth lecture onwards, if, if yes. I'm not mistaken. So this question is from uh, Ethan, Ethan Pham, who asks, uh, 
uh, this is, it says, you had stated earlier that controlling a robot after you had gotten used to the controls made you actually feel as if you were in Stockholm. And so virtual reality is a technology made to feel as if you were somewhere else. But the current technology we have today is not a full dive, as in no. you could feel as if you were realistically interacting with everything in the environment. Do you believe that something like a full dive virtual reality would be possible? And of course, uh, the fact that we're all, everything we sense is, Neuro is electrical signals in the brain, according to this astonishing hypothesis. Uh, what's your take on this? Well, it uh, it depends what you mean by full dive here. I, I think the the tech the virtual reality technologies are getting better and better, and it's it's partially a matter of how much money you're willing to spend uh but also but uh, also it's a matter of imagination you know i i mean i never was in doubt if that uh i i i wasn't actually in stockholm I, if i thought about it for a moment but if you don't think about it and just uh, too much uh, and just enjoy the show you can very uh, my experience is you can really feel as if you're somewhere else, and uh, and this was with rather primitive uh, technology. It's it's going to get better, and uh, how should I say? I think most all of us have probably had the experience of having a dream, where uh, we we dream something that's that's really crazy, and I couldn't, have, but. It, in in the moment, uh, it's hard to tell whether it's reality or not. So uh, I think it, it, experiences like that are certainly possible, and uh, if if you're willing to go with the flow, uh, you it'll be a richer and richer uh, possibility for experience. So you talked about uh, simulations, and uh, we we seem quite confident that the world we actually live in is not a simulation for various reasons. But maybe the opposite is possible, that we could create a simulation that is so rich, uh, and maybe that would, you know, we'd have to attach it to our brains in some ways, uh, that uh, if you were to enter it, it, you would really be able to live in a reality that... Um, yeah, well, in yeah, th those are interesting prospects. I think the... Uh, the very tangible possibility that I think is not only a possibility, but a, a, an overwhelming probability is that as we develop artificial intelligences, which after all do live, <laughs> do live in a manufactured world, mm -hmm. uh, that they will develop a sense of identity, consciousness, if you like, and uh, for them, the, the, the hypothesis that the world is a simulation will be just true. <laughs> That's, uh, and, uh, uh, or, or they could be true. I mean, we, we might or might not, we could have some forms of artificial intelligence that we want to function sort of as robots uh, and, and, and function sort of as humanoids, in in the natural world but you could also have artificial intelligences that are completely living within uh the computer and for, for such things the simulation hypothesis would be true yeah that's right that's the case and i uh, that's going to happen i have no doubt <laughs> all right uh so uh with on that note uh thank uh thank you for this wonderful lecture and uh, i hope to that we'll all uh, get to join you again on Friday. So uh, see, um, to the audience, uh, have a great Thank evening. You. So, you. so I'm glad I toughed it out. So anyway, and I'll see you hopefully on Friday. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye now.